Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 576. That's episode number 576 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. How are me? How am I? How are me? Doing pretty well, actually. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. It's been an absolute barnstorm of a week for me, the week and a half. Um, I'm just reporting it. So imagine living through the stuff I'm going to talk about. But it's been an absolute barnstorm. If you've been paying attention to anything happening on my main YouTube channel, in terms of the other videos I've been uploading and streams, you would have seen I've been absolutely balls deep in the coverage concerning Brendan Shaw, Bobby Lee, you know, Annie Lederman, Kalila, um, Esther P Pavitsky, um, loads of other people, right, who are involved in this mad LA comedy scene Bruja going on at the moment where somebody might have, you know, got in someone's DMs who's in a relationship while they're in a relationship, which got outed, which then led to another story getting leaked, which then led to this conspiracy about Reddit and about who did it, who did what, who did what, bloody blah, blah, blah. So it's been nice to do all that as one thing, but it's also been nice to get back on this tip and focus more on the cultural stuff that I'm obviously way more interested in than that stuff. The funny thing is when it comes to YouTube, when it comes to content generation, is that when you are making all these things, usually for me personally, especially at the level that I'm at, I'm making it only for me. I want to be a pure creative force artist in that way. I'm making it purely for my own entertainment, purely for my own mental way of being. I remember when I, when my first podcast episode, I released episode number one. You can even go back and listen to it. I recorded it on a shitty dictaphone that I then plugged into my um, laptop and uploaded onto Flipping Garage Band and clipped. That was it. That was the maximum work I was doing back then, recording it into a dictaphone, walking around my house, absolutely nutty behavior. But I remember when I uploaded that w episode one, I remember saying quite categorically that my main inspiration for doing this show was you know Bill Burr and Joe Rogan obviously Joe Rogan for just making a podcast and talking about interesting things and of course Bill Burr because he did it solo and I knew for me personally I always wanted to do like a solo podcast I never wanted to have like it it be guest heavy and all that sort of stuff I didn't really want to ask people for interviews um, I just wanted to kind of you know shoot a shit with you guys here on the podcast myself but I also remember saying on that episode number one the main reason why I did this show was that it brought me some sort of um, solace, especially mentally, because I have so many thoughts running through my head on a daily basis. And because of my weird um, temperament, where I, I'm very extroverted, but very introverted in some way, and I'm generally really bad at keeping relationships and friendships and stuff, I generally don't tend to have a lot of people in my life, right? I tend to have a very small circle, if not even a circle, just probably people I can count on one hand I could call friends right I don't really have many but then I have a lot of things I'm interested in so a lot of these things I don't get to talk about them with people because I don't have any friends apart from people I might you know socialize with or talk to online in terms of liking retweeting and the odd comment here and there but no real meaningful you know out loud conversations like this so sometimes I'll be having these self conversations with myself a lot where I'd be talking to myself, walking around, and it'd be a bit nutty. So I thought, you know what? Instead of just doing all that all the time, why don't I just record it? Because I'm talking to myself for an hour anyway. I might as well turn on the mic and just turn it into a show. And that's the main reason why I did it. But it was mostly, again, it came from a purely selfish point of view, as in like, okay, I need this in order to make sure that I keep myself sane. Over time, of course, it's turned into something like, oh, this could be something I could maybe do as a little side hobby. This could be something I could do as a little side hustle. This could be something that I could do as a career going forward. But it's always just been the play, play, play thing. But one of the annoying things about content generation is that sometimes you do content that you don't want to do and it ends up taking off. For instance, the LA comedy scene stuff. I only started really covering it in any sort of detail at the beginning of the pandemic because I was bored and had nothing to do. And I was kind of entertaining myself with just talking about this stuff because why not? And then all of a sudden, people started watching it. And then suddenly the videos that I was uploading, you know, concerning my podcast that were getting like 10 listens, 10 views or whatnot, right? Suddenly I'll upload a, pod, a, a clip about, you know, something someone did in the LA comedy scene and it'd get 10,000 views. I'll be like, what the hell? I didn't, well, none, none of my videos that I've done myself have ever got that kind of stuff or the stuff that I want to talk about. So... I'm in a weird predicament with that kind of stuff, right? I don't want to talk about it too much, but everyone wants to hear my thoughts on it. It's like, ugh. So, you know, you got to serve the... I guess on one side, what I've got to do, like most great 
underground bands or artists or movements that I've liked in the, in yesterday yester years, what they used to do is that the idea was that it wasn't about selling out. The idea was to get the money from the corporations to then feed back into the work that you were doing on a ground level or feed back into the underground scene, underground scene scheme. So you take that money, you take that check from Toyota and you'd feed it into maybe taking more chances on your next album instead of taking that money from Toyota and then trying to chase more checks from that kind of, you know, corporate side of things. That's what people sometimes get caught up in. And then by then your art history is completely gone and any kind of, you know, um, source that you had is completely disappeared. So this is what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to maybe service the fans that want that, that kind of stuff on one end, but then focus on the podcast on the other end, which is why I think going forward, more likely than not, I will probably end up splitting it and just starting a new channel or buying a channel that's already maybe pre-done already um, with a certain viewer base and then just start dumping all those comedy videos on that thing and just keep this one mainly for the cultural commentary stuff on the Agostino Zinger show. I think I might end up doing that because I want to do that too for my DJing stuff because it's getting a bit weird having me talking about this podcast after then the comedy stuff happens and you see me DJ on, on live stream. It can get a little bit crazy about what's going on here. So I'll probably end up splitting it into three channels. I'll probably have the Agostino Zinger show to be the main place where I have all my podcast stuff or I'll loaded on there the clips and obviously the the full shows um that you're listening to or watching and then i'll probably have the random show channel where obviously i do my commentary on the la comedy scene and just stuff in general hence the name the random show and then of course i'll have my own dj artist profile where i upload things concerning live streams um, for myself really and maybe a clip here and there i might even put that one to be like the place where i might do i might actually make that a label one so i might actually make that like a you know that label that i had on sound on soundcloud a little fake label called persistence i might just name the third one persistence have all my dj live streams on there have maybe some stuff concerning you know dance music stuff i might talk on there and maybe in depth or whatnot that might be something i'll look into so just to keep it a little bit clean because at the moment it's a bit cluttered do you know what i mean there's only so many playlists i can make and i don't even know if people even use them do you know what i mean so i'm probably going to end up doing it that way going forward but um i'm not going to complain because i'm happy people are watching my stuff anyway so thank you for those of you that are tuning in um on that note please check out my patreon i have just released a new patreon episode um that i uploaded actually just earlier on today i haven't been uploading or updating my patreon in a while because i've been lazy and i've just taken my eye off the ball because of course i've been you know inundated and preoccupied of all this la comedy scene stuff and obviously doing my main podcast but seeing as people on patreon are actually paying it's not much but they're still paying and i really respect that and honor that that they're separating themselves from their wallet and giving me one dollar two dollar five dollar fifteen whatever it may be to do this nonsense i'm doing at the moment so the least i could do is to obviously honor that by ensuring that i'm uploading regularly on there so what i'm aiming to do going forward is obviously having a one one a week post on there that's only going to be for the patreon supporters you'll never see that content anywhere else and at the moment i've got a latest one that i've just uploaded now um titled why does everyone hate kalila and it's available there episode number 19 and obviously you can see the other ones as well you can check out my main page in terms of the what you call it in terms of the tiers i have available one dollar four dollars eleven or pounds whatever i don't know how much it's going to show up on your side of things but it's a pretty self-explanatory in terms of being able to join really easy tiers there and then of course i've got all the posts there ready for you to go when you're willing and able to do so so definitely jump on my patreon as you can see there it is let me get rid of that bit it is patreon.com for slash agostino patreon.com for slash agostino join get involved don't delay it's really a fun time over there on the patreon so jumping back onto it let's get into the podcast and let's go in number one news um something really sad for me especially um because i've been a big fan of the guy's music for a while and um i've actually was wondering why he hasn't dropped anything new in a while but then i remember hearing something about him putting together a new tape or mixtape i think it was i'm not really too sure but regardless um the legend the young legend also known as little kid um from ysl has unfortunately passed away really 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 tragic news especially off the back of what's happening with young fuck gunner in the whole of ysl to hear he's dying especially at the age of 24 is like no age to die for somebody who is just getting started in their career and had so much potential to fulfill it's really 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 incredibly sad 
Um, this is from the New York Times. It reads as follows. Lil Key, a budding melodic rapper from Atlanta with a delicate voice that he often stretches to helium high auto-tuned falsetto, died on Friday in Los Angeles. He's 24. The musician's death was confirmed on Saturday by a representative of his record label, 300 Entertainment, who did not specify a cause. Keith had been scheduled to perform at a music festival in Charlotte, North Carolina on Saturday night. Born Rahid Javon Rendon in March 1698, Keed hailed from the neighborhood known as Cleveland Cleveland Avenue for its main for for its main thoroughfare where Southwest Atlanta meets the suburb of East Point in Fulton County. He chronicled his turbulent upbringing there, surrounded by poverty, drugs, and violence, and in a three-part mixtape series trapped in Cleveland. His final storm was released in 2020. I dig deep into my story and let everybody see what I'm through, uh, what I went through, sorry, how I came up and I give them an insight into my life. He said in an interview with Complex in 2018, Keen side of 300 Entertainment and Young Stone Alive Records, or YSL, under the tutelage of mentor and melodic rapper Young Fuck. Earlier this week, Young Fuck and 27 members were uh, labeled were incarcerated on the sorry, were charged on a RICO indictment handed down by a grand jury in Fulton County. The indictment alleged that YSL is a criminal street gang responsible for murders, robberies, and drug dealing. I was actually surprised Keed and Little Got It, his, his um, younger brother actually were not wrapped up in that whole uh, RICO charge. So maybe it might have showed that they maybe had joined later on when it was actually a label. And obviously when the label slash street gang, you know, was basic, it was started. Unfortunately, everyone associated with it was tied up in it in some way, shape or form. Um, but yes, continuing to say, Keed was not charged, responded in a graphic posted on social media that said, YSL is a family, YSL is a label, YSL is a way of life, YSL is a lifestyle, YSL is not a gang. In 2020, Keed was named XXL Freshman Magazine's annual freshman class, a prominent launch pad for rappers, appearing on the covers alongside Giacarlo, five-year foreign. The year prior, his breakout single, Nameless, a raunchy number with a sing-song stickiness that became a regional radio hit. Keed also released seven fallen projects in two years, worked widely with artists from Lil Yai to Ghana, Future Lil Zivir and Rowdy Rich. Keed's brother and frequent collaborator Lil Got It reacted to the death on Friday night and said, I did all, I did all my cries. I know what you want me to do, and that's to go hard for mama, for mama, daddy, our brothers. Keed is also survived by his daughter, Nai, Nai Churo, no, sorry, Nature, and his girlfriend known as Kwan, Kwana Bands. What am I supposed to tell Nature? Why am I going to tell you new, our new baby? Confident in winning with a wide smile and open-minded eagerness, Keed was frank about his ambition to grow beyond the, the often grim Southern street rap tales that often that first got him noticed. I want to be a megastar, he said. I don't want to be no superstar. I want to be a megastar. Three is unlike a friendship. Da, 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 da. Oh yeah, true. Three is unlike a friendship. Um... Uh, with advertising executive and motivation guru Gary Vaynerchuk, Keed True was name dropping the song. The rapper nearly appeared in the 2019 Super Bowl commercial with the Planters with Mr. Peanut and Ike Rogers. However, the role fell through. At the studio summit later that year, Mr. Vaynerchuk encouraged Keed to expand his presence on TikTok to reach a new audience. I'm going to do this, Keed said, energized by the audience, and I'll be like, he told me. His new music was starting to reflect that. Keed said, back then I was talking about stuff like typical rappers shooting and killing. Um, he told Complex because that's what everybody does. He continued, I was just talking about the stuff that happened in the streets, stuff around me. Now that I'd done grown from all of that, I moved myself out of that situation. I'm letting folks know why I'm so trapped in Clo why, why I was trapped in Cleveland, as far as me going to the hood every day and all the shootouts. I just had to move myself out of the situation to better myself and my family. So tragic, and he did all of that to move himself out, and then he ends up passing away through unspecified reasons um obviously speculating on that is a bit pointless at the moment so i'm not going to do that especially being a fan of his music but i will just say in a way to kind of honor his legacy i will be playing a track off of long live mexico which was definitely one of my favorite tapes from him and definitely something that kind of caught my attention when i started to get to know him as an artist so i'll definitely be playing a track off of that long live mexico that came out i think in that 2019 2018 if you haven't checked that out please do um r.i.p little keed man absolutely tragic 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 news off the back of what's happening with YSL and yeah pray for prayers go back to his, his, his close friends family and everyone associated with him man probably a hard hard time right now and then um <clears throat> to continue unfortunately the sad news try and get all this all out at the beginning of the show I know it's not the best way to start a podcast but these things need to be spoken about because you know they're happening in the culture and it's something that I think is important to highlight um, this news, courtesy of Resident Advisor, it says Ellen Pervicor, 
I don't know how you, say, is that you pronounce it, Ellen Percival, sorry, Ellen Percival, aka DJ Mooncup, <clears throat> identified as person who had died after attending Bangface. And I saw this news, of course, over the weekend. Bangface is a very popular festival here in the UK. And there was news that somebody had passed away within the first couple of days of that festival. Um, the identity of the person obviously wasn't shared or anything, but that was a story that was going around and it was absolutely tragic because, you know, Bangface hasn't been on for two and a half years since the pandemic has been on, right? It's been the first bang, bang face since the pandemic and it kind of sold out. People are really eager for it. Loads of great DJs playing there. And to hear this is just a really tragic news. And it's even worse because it's somebody within the community who people knew and loved so you can only just imagine what their family is going through um because it, it, it continues it says ellen percival um aka moon cup has been identified as a person in a statement you know, so unresponsive uh, is been identified as a person found unresponsive at bankface last weekend pardon me in a statement posted yesterday may 12th percival's father martin identified ellen as a festival goer confirming that they were found unresponsive at pontin southport holiday park in the morning of friday may 6th their partner called paramedics and Percival was taken to a medical hospital where they pronounced dead at 8.30 a.m. They were 33 years old, man. No age to die. Absolutely tragic. Ellen was a force of nature and I'm so very proud of my daughter, wrote Martin. They packed more than 33 years into many people can do. No, they packed more in 33 years than many people do more than double their numbers of years. Ellen and partner Ollie had just bought a house in Bristol. Oh. We're talking. We're talking about the possibility of starting a family and have a lovely cat called Arthur. Fucking hell, man! Ellen was enjoying their job in the Library of Bristol University. Was finishing off their MS, um, their masters in biological, in biological recording. Totally enjoying their club and DJ work, and always had the multiple projects on the go. Just sounds like an absolute boss, right? Living the dream. Um, you know, starting a family. Uh, pursuing a job in an area that she's obviously in an obviously in an area they're interested in um, further education and then doing the, the DJing on the side like absolute dream I will miss Ellen immensely as will Ollie their friends and family the Merseyside police have said that there's no suspicious of foul play there will still be a post-mortem to determine the cause of death as a DJ Percival played um, for parties such as Rye Wax Strange Brew and Pulse Whip they were also a regular on Bristol's, Nod Ra Bristol's Nude Radio. Percival's father, partner and friends will hold a memorial picnic um, in their memory in St. George's Park, Bristol, Saturday, May 21st, 1pm. Read Martin's post in full and some more tributes below. Uh, Martin's, yeah, Percival, that's the, my apologies, this is the first time you're hearing the sad news. <sighs> Another, another, another post here from Ryowak says we wrote a little tribute for our dear friend Ellen Percival. DJ Moon Couple will forever be missed, forever be a part of Ryowak. Another person called La Rona Lorima said the following was deeply saddened to hear Ellen's death last week, who I knew 11 years ago in London. They were kind, caring, punk big sister. They went on to carve out their own niche and I've moved and I moved pursuing the project they went to to, to achieve. Rest in power, DJ Moon Cup. Psyche says we were standing to hear about this bit of passing long standing volunteer and close friend, Ellen Percival. They were bitterly missed by many this summer and beyond. DJ RP DJ Moon Cup. Absolutely tragic, isn't it? Um, I don't know, man. It's really, really tragic and really upsetting, especially considering the festival just got started. I think it might have been the first day or something. So you can just imagine how how weird of a vibe it must have been there at the festival after someone, you know, was taken ill and then later pronounced dead. You can only imagine how that news was received by the family and friends, you know, going to a festival. You have no, you have, it doesn't even cross your mind that you're going to not come home. You know what I mean? Especially if family and friends are not thinking you're not going to come home after going to a festival. Especially a festival like Banfax, which by all accounts is very, very well organised. Um, and people tend to really look after each other. So it's really tragic that this should end in this way. Um, but yeah, man, hopefully people honour their legacy on Saturday, the 21st of May in St. George's Park in Bristol. If you're around, definitely go and honour your on honour their legacy. Um, you know, say your prayers, say your tributes and hug each other in it because that's all we got really. But that first bit about starting, yeah, I can't, man. So sad, man. So, so, so bitterly sad. But anyway, we move on, we move on. I'm really sorry about all this sad news, but we just have to get this out of the way because, 
you know it just is what it is um next on the list we're going to talk about this obviously I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of the tragic shooting that happened in buffalo new york where a white supremacist decided to go to a shopping district somewhere or shopping mall and gun down loads of innocent people um because they have in their head that they're being replaced they're, you know they're kind of advocates or proponents of the great replacement theory which basically um says that um I think it's it's a Camus so I think it's a Camus thing. It must be a Camus thing, where they basically um under what well, they basically under the thinking that they're being replaced in their uh, in their country because of mass migration, right through black and brown people, and the response to that is to obviously cleanse their nation of all migrants of all um of all minorities in order to keep it pure. And I guess in an effort to do so, he went to a, sh a shopping center that was populated by mostly migrants or mostly sorry, mostly minority people and decided to gun them all down. And yeah, absolutely tragic news, man. really, really tragic. The discourse of um, The Guardian it said it was by design. Black residents tried to come to terms with the horror of the shooting. Uh, vigils were held across Buffalo, New York for the victims of the Tops Friendly shooting. Um, sorry, the top's friendly, I guess that's what the center is called, shooting on Sunday, as black residents of the city's east side mourned and attempted to come to terms with the brief, brutal event that had been visited on the neighborhood hours earlier. The square where the shooting took place, surrounded by vacant lots, the residents said were the result of decades of segregation, systemic racism in the community center. So it's absolutely dilapidated by most accounts, it looks like, with Tops Friendly um, functioning as the only grocery store for the immediate area. Jesus Christ, what an evil piece of shit. The only grocery shop they have in that surrounding area and then you go and murder people in cold blood in striking top friendly the shooter an 18 year old self-confessed white supremacist was not just hit in a supermarket but also a place where locals gathered as a community it says the quote here no weapons formed against us shall prosper said karen davis butler a nurse and a mother of three who had tears streaming down her face it means that there's it means that's formed against god is going to have sure it's going to make sure it doesn't hurt us but we were but we were covered yesterday but we weren't covered yesterday and the guy wasn't covered and I feel bad for him too. Despite the horrors, let's not do this whole forgiveness thing as well that black people do. Let's not do that. Let the guy burn in hell wherever he may end up, man. Fuck him. Um, despite the horrors um, wrought on the neighborhood by the 18-year-old white shooter, Davis Butler said others were to blame too for filling him with hate. He said, she said the following, he's only 18. Damn, nearly grown. Where did he learn all this stuff from? Who's pushed this into his head? Where was his parents when he was looking at the stuff on the internet? This is like a gang thing with them, but it's white supremacy and racism. It's taught. You're not born hating black people. Good point. Davis um, Butler said she was in a fa she was in a family dollar next to next to next to the supermarket when the shooting began. We saw everybody running and they told us to stay in the store. It was crazy. Um, this is where Juneteenth started. Wow where our community used to thrive we had food the desert we had we have a food desert here and that's racism too so where juneteenth started is a food desert and there's only one shop there that they can all shop at crazy if you go on the other side of the city you will see grocery store after grocery store the racism here is all every day i guess that's similar to what we have in my part of east london or where i was brought up and it's, or yeah where i was brought up specifically which is yeah, let's not say it here actually but the power of um, of, of east under that I was, grow I was brought up in the only thing in that area that you'll find are chicken shops and betting shops and iceland's the most upmarket supermarket that we had at that time in that area was a um what is it called oh well it's not morris and something else what's the thing called it doesn't matter it's a green shop but it's not a tesco's so those are the most upmarket shop but most of the shops that surround that entire strip from where i was born and kind of the main road were just chicken shops and betting shops it's the only thing and the only people that you see in those chicken shops and betting shops were people that look my look like myself or other brown people do you know what i mean it was just that black and brown people only were in there you didn't really see anything else it's only in the last few years now that that place has become or that area has become is it's getting a bit gentrified and they're now building new flats they're bringing new residents in there who are coming from outside of the area um now they're trying to change and obviously service their needs by giving them upmarket stores um and whatnot and just more of a kind of upmarket flavor but when we were there you know fighting for survival they didn't do none of that so you know these things happen all the time this social engineering luck is crazy um it says here or you know urban planning whatever they call it 
It continues here, it says, to Maurice Burris, another resident, the journey that Shooter allegedly made from his home in, Col in Colkin near Bigmington, 200 miles south, meant that he passed upstate New York cities like Rochester and Syracuse. And the quote says here, it was by design. He knew what he was doing and that's so sad. We've got sick people here and some people would like nothing more than to have a race war and they'll do anything to try and cause it. People need to wake up. He drove 200 miles to do this. He wasn't even local. Absolutely sickening, isn't it? And he passed all the lovely white areas, obviously, and then got, went and murdered black people. So they have to call this a white supremacist thing, isn't it? They can't call it anything else because he didn't go there to... He didn't go there to go meet his girlfriend, did he? Um, the neighborhood, Burr said, had begun to come back from the blight of the previous decades, but to get up in the morning and see all this is bad. He said, waving to the enc encampments of police and the media trucks that had suddenly sprouted um, in the strong May sun. It's bad enough that that goes on in the area already. Twins, Shamika and Tanishka and Tashika Walker were standing on the corner of Raleigh and Jefferson, surveying the scene. He was telling him on live stream that he was what he was going to do. Oh yeah, that's the other part of the story too, isn't it? He was live streaming the whole thing. I saw a screen grab somebody shared where the tip of his gun, near the nozzle, I think, of the gun, he had um, written like white tipex and nigger with a hard R. Absolute psycho, man. And obviously he wrote a manifesto, I think it's 180 pages full of like crazy um, replacement theory nonsense and um what do you, you wrote stuff about you know st measuring human skull was it just non nonsense stuff in there like god almighty he was telling them i'm not sure what he was going to do but they probably took it as a joke said tashika but a joke is not and the shooter had repeatedly posted massive so um messages about the great replacement theory the ideological underpinning of many racist mass shootings including the one in norway and new zealand the quote says they're probably saying that they were having too many black children, but the community here is made up of all different races. The irony, the community here is like a family and tops is really always helpful. So how, so how he had the audacity to come here and do this. What have you drive? What, what made you drive all this way to hit to, and to do this and why? And you know, what's really shocking and disappointing about this too. He was taken alive. He was taken alive. Do you remember that guy who was pushed over in the, during the black lives matter protest? I think it was in Buffalo too. Some old dude, white guy actually. He was he was I guess trying to protest, walking towards a whole squadron full of police, um, wearing their riot gear and stuff. And he looked harmless, skinny dude. You know, maybe six foot two, but he looked completely harmless. He's not gonna do anything to those guys. He walks up to them with his hands open, and they just push him. And obviously, because he's old, he doesn't have good balance, and he stumbles and legit whacks his head on the side of the curb, and he just is lying there like concussed i don't know what it is it looks like he had brain damage but supposedly he, he kind of supposedly sorry he recovered pretty well and he didn't want to press charges or anything and for whatever reason you know as we always know the police that were involved in it were found completely innocent of any wrongdoing but he was treated way more harshly for just being at a protest and having his arms open and just kind of walking towards the police as as opposed to this guy who went there with a flipping semi-automatic weapon or whatever it was a heavy caliber weapon and killed people many many people i think it was how many people did he kill was it 10 8 i'm not really too sure actually let me double check this other article i don't know how many people actually died in this um this is from the reuters um he killed 10 people 10 people were died 10 sorry that were killed in this racist attack in new york and somehow they took him alive absolutely crazy stuff man it's funny how how kind of sensible the policing can be based upon your skin color in it no matter what country you are in the, the police get in you know the police get reckless and silly and then it's all it's there's only there are some bad apple talks and then when they need to be sensible and, and treat people with care and use kid gloves they can absolutely shocking state of affairs again my heart goes out to everybody that was involved in this in it absolutely shocking 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 state of affairs man i can't imagine the untold pain everyone's going through and then to end the misery talk because i'm really sorry about this to start a podcast like this but we just have to kind of get this real life stuff out of the way um al jazeera journalist is killed in the west bank r.i.p 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 um to shireen abu akel who was killed unfortunately in israel shocking stuff and the funny thing about this is that most likely from what all accounts we've been kind of told she was definitely killed by the israeli defense force right the idf 
but all the coverage around it makes it seem as if it was just some random person or she was caught in a crossfire or something but she's a press you know a long-time press journalist um, sorry, she's a long-time journalist who's been covering that region for many, many years, is a, an American citizen by all accounts too, and was there, you know, clearly covered in press attire with a press helmet, with a press uh, body armor, clearly looking at somebody that's going there to go and cover what's going on. And then she was shot point blank from what I, from what the reports I've been reading by the IDF. But everything that they're covering, it makes it seem as if it was just some, you know, some some indiscriminate thing that happened in just the heat of the moment this is what this is an article courtesy of new york times that kind of tells the same thing it says yeah a journalist from al jazeera was fatally shot in the west bank city of janine early wednesday the news network um and palestinian health minister said blaming israeli forces for her death see blaming but it happened it's directly the circumstances surrounding the shooting of the journalists um were not immediately clear but she was shot as clashes between the israeli military and palestinian government took place and apparently she was shot in the head too Al Jazeera citing the health ministry said the journalist had been shot in the head by Israeli forces during a raid. A second journalist was hospitalized after being hit in the back, the ministry said. Al Jazeera holds the Israeli government and occupation forces responsible for the killing of Shireen. It also, it also calls on the international community to condemn and hold Israel accountable. So it hold the occupation, hold the Israel occupation forces accountable. And it's funny the the response this is getting vis-a-vis -vis what people how people are responding online to when you know there are reports coming out of Russian troops you know indiscriminately killing Ukrainian citizens obviously out there going on with what has, what's happening over there in Ukraine completely different you know reaction online completely completely different which you know because you show how nonsense all this stuff is it continues the Israeli military chief of staff Avi Kod Kochavi. Is it Aviv Kochavi said that he it was not clear who had shot the journalist. Yeah, sure. Um, of course, the Israeli ministry um, chief would say that. In a separate statement, the military said it was investigating the possibility that the journalist was hit by a Palestinian government. God. In the evening briefing, Israel Minister of Defense Benny Gantz emphasized the uncertainty. It says it can be Palestinians who shot her. Tragically, it may be on our side. We are investigating it. Miss Abu Akeli, 51, a veteran journalist who was wearing a protective vest, would have identified her as a member of the press. Um, video from the moments before I was showed. The video broadcast by Al Jazeera does, does not show Miss Abu um, being shot, but gunfire can be heard in the first few seconds, followed by a man yelling, Injured, Shireen, Shireen, oh man, Shireen, ambulance. As he continues to yell for ambulance, the camera moves towards Miss Abu, who is slumped face down. Next to her in the video, another journalist identified in the network as Shatha Hans, Hannah Shai. Hannah Hanaya Shah um, also wearing a vest marked press and the helmet crouches down and tries to reach out to Miss Abu Kili but she's forced back by gunfire. Miss Hanayasha told Miss Hanayasha told Al Jazeera that there had been um, and there had been no in no confrontation between Palestinian fighters and Israeli forces when the shots were fired towards the journalists, adding that she believed that they were being targeted. So they're targeting journalists, legitimately killing journalists in the field, and then trying to point the finger at the Palestinians. Absolutely heinous. R.I.P. Shireen. R.I.P. Shireen. Okay, moving on. We're going to get into some sillier stuff now because of course all that stuff is a bit heavy but i'm not sure if you guys are familiar or if you guys care but i'm a big big fan of no jumper i've been watching that channel for many many years now and over the years they've kind of um pivoted and started to build up their podcasting network it feels like i mostly watch it on youtube so it's maybe not the traditional podcast that you'd listen to on audio only format but i do like the variety of shows they have i do like the variety of hosts they have i do like the fact that it's la based they're a bit wilder it feels like and a bit more shooting off the hip and they want to make it a bit of a show i don't know if that's a thing that makes any sense but there's a lot of entertainment value that comes from it um i think it's something that i like to listen to in the background something i like to watch actively or sometimes if i'm on a mad one just i like to watch if i'm getting fucked up at home and i want to feel like i'm in a room with somebody getting fucked up with it's really really bizarre but i definitely do enjoy the show i definitely do enjoy it and obviously one of the main characters somebody who people think is a you know one of the main characters sorry some of the people think is one of the kind of favorites of that show and that channel and that podcast network is house phone who also goes by his moniker little house phone right he's also a rapper too but people know him mostly from no jumper and obviously doing his own brand 
called um I forgot the name of it. It's Dice. It's Dice's, and they have him on sneakers and stuff, which is pretty cool. But mostly, you know, his kind of fame, I would say, or kind of notoriety has come from being, you know, associated with No Jumper. But for whatever reason, being that he's maybe well liked and well regarded, and maybe some would say talented in terms of being a great personality in front of the camera, he also takes the piss. And he takes the piss by just not turning up a lot of the times. Um, not giving the guys notice, if it sounds like, because they talk about it on the show when he doesn't arrive, obviously, or it doesn't appear. Um, for whatever reason, whatever the show's on, let's say it's a Wednesday or a Tuesday or Thursday or Friday, it always coincides with him having some sort of family emergency. So, you know, most likely he's full of shit, right? It's just a standard thing. It doesn't make any sense why every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, every Friday, you always seem to have some kind of family issue that you're going through. Now, to be charitable to him, he did make it known that his mum, I think, is going through some health struggle, which is kind of affecting him, you know, personally, mentally, whatever, because obviously it's his mum. And he's obviously because I think it's just him with his mum. I think he's the only child, if I'm not mistaken. He's always having to look after her. So a lot of his time outside of the show is probably spent looking after her, making sure she's right. But unfortunately in the real world people have issues all the time we have things that we're going through and usually your work doesn't necessarily um, cave to your demands in terms of your personal life you have to basically make your personal life fit around your work and just kind of get get it sorted right and just kind of figure it out along the way just is what is part of being a grown-up you can't just you know take your ball and go home because um you're upset with something you just have to kind of suck it up and get to work especially if you want to get paid it just is what it is and he doesn't necessarily seem to be able to do that. And I think partly is to do with that. Partly is to do with the fact that he's obviously well regarded. So you think he takes a piss. But I think the other kind of elephant in the room with this is his kind of long documented struggle with drugs and just, you know, the hard drugs, the party drugs, the cokes, the, the ketamines, the mollies, whatever it may be, right? Those drugs that would more often than not kind of take you away from take you off your path in terms of you doing something constructive in your life because I know I've been there right I know how hard it can be to balance being a party kid and also having dreams also having ambition also having work that needs to be done it's just near on I would say impossible to do to balance both of the things you have to decide whether or not you want to be a party kid or whether or not you want to be a businessman it just is what it is there is no mixing of the two things I don't think in my side of things because I've done them both to really excessive hardcore amounts or, or i've done them both to the limit sorry or hardcore amounts of course but they've definitely done them to the limits and i've noticed that the only way to really get forward especially with the, the hobbies that i kind of want to do the djing stuff the content creation the podcast and all that sort of things you just have to have to be a, you have to be at your best and to be at your best you have to be somewhat sober you can't be going into all these things blasted or you know suffering from a hangover because it just won't work or you just won't be bothered to do it in the first place and i feel like the reason why he's not turning up most of the times is because he has been on some sort of bender my so that's my own part that's my own point of view and i'm saying that because i know from my own personal period and of my own personal experience the times that i've not turned up to things and i've flaked on things or i've just been crappy at you know keeping in contact with people has been usually when i've been absolutely blitzed out of my mind and i've had an absolutely barnstorming crazy Bergheim weekend or something do you know what i mean usually i'm kind of you know out of action for a couple of days after that so imagine if you're working with people who do content on the pacific day it's a big network everyone's filming around the clock if you don't if you don't do your show on that day it's not like you can do it an hour later you have to just do it next week again so obviously that kind of fucks up the whole thing you've got a show going on you can't have you can't be especially if you're running the thing you can't can't be seen to be letting people take the piss even though you're somebody as talented duh, 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 duh. so i generally think most of the time it's because of that there could be other things to do with the family but just for me speaking as a fan of his and a fan of the show it seems that to me the the party side of things is getting a little bit crazy and it makes sense though because over the last few months or years it felt like no over the last couple of years it felt like his own brand house fans brand has really been popping off and it's been doing really well he's been doing pop-ups he's you know started to do merch now he's not just doing shoes and unfortunately if you have a tendency to be a party kid and then you start to get more money more likely than not if you haven't curtailed the tendencies to go out and pick up an eight ball 
you the first thing you do when you get some money is you're gonna go buy your own eight ball because maybe before he was scrimping a couple of grams here and there or you know jacking a couple of bumps here and there having a line up here and there but then when you suddenly get your own money now you can actually go out and buy your own eight ball right? i mean maybe buy an ounce buy whatever do you know what i mean and go absolutely crazy so i think that's what's happened like more money has essentially caused him more issues and he now has more access to things that he probably didn't have access to and obviously the clout also is maybe you know brought people around him that probably aren't the most constructive people and maybe are a bad influence whatever it may be but it does look like the end is nigh with highest phone if you um if you abide by this um video that was posted on the no jumper subreddit uh, it's titled actually house phones last day and no jumper is approaching where adam the head of no jumper the founder of no jumper is basically speaking about how he had a conversation with no with house phone and basically told him this is it i gave house phone the, the serious facts like you bet you ghost the podcast one more time it's over did he reply no but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I finally actually no. took a stand and was like, bro, you can't keep doing this. Yeah. Like, this is so out of pocket. Nobody else would give you this long of a leash in terms of this shit. You just, you can't keep doing this to us. It's over, you know? Man, I hope my boy all right. Oh, Dang, God, it has been a leash it. of years. It's been many, you feel what I'm saying? Many so years of but the, I feel like the main thing is, like, at least send us like, the, the hour, hour pretext and be like, guys, hour anything maybe two hours that is so not how actual podcasts work like every podcast i know and and by all accounts if i'm not mistaken also kiki one of the guys sitting across from adam who happens to be the half brother of ad who's also another host on there he also has been fired as um adam uh, personal security the story goes that he didn't turn up to a gig that they were meant to do or he was meant to catch a flight with adam to chicago and didn't turn up and didn't give him any notice and this happened quite a few times so he's fired kiki so he's obviously putting his foot down but it's it seems like running a podcast network especially if you're a very you know big personality yourself look at what happened to joe budden and look what's happening now with adam 22 on no jumper is very difficult it's very very difficult and i think in just in general forget big personality i think just in general managing people is super 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 hard and it seems like to me anyway i don't know if this makes any sense it seems like to me the only way to really do it the only way to really do it that makes sense is to maybe hire somebody to do the managing of the podcast network side of things maybe i don't know if they're called like a program director is that is that what they're called maybe a, a podcast manager i don't know someone who can maybe just handle the day-to-day -day goings on of like scheduling of making sure who's won what show you no know, scheduling who making sure who, who what, who's hosting what show making sure people are getting there on time managing just the hr side of things that maybe needs to be done by somebody else and not the person who maybe founded the network the podcast whatever it may be that maybe is a better way to go about it and maybe you use the person who founded it as a sort of like mark no somebody to maybe draw people in and to maybe you know go out there and get more hosts or to negotiate contracts with new people that side but in terms of the managing of it day to day it might be beneficial to get another person involved just so there's a bit of distance and maybe so the host also can maybe take it more seriously so they're not thinking it's just their friend because i'm sure part of maybe house phone's defense would be like yeah this is adam and he's my boy we've been doing this general jumper thing for years so you don't necessarily see it as such a big deal if you miss a couple of shows here and there which doesn't really make any sense really you think so because you know having this opportunity to be on no jump is a huge opportunity it's something that you shouldn't be taking for granted like if this thing was here and i was younger and i cared about being a part of a gang and a crew and representing someone i think i'll definitely be a you know running to have an opportunity to you know to be a part of their show or just to help out in any way shape or form obviously now i like to do my own thing and kind of move to, to the sound of my own drum but still i think they take it for granted a lot and it's weird because a lot of these guys don't come from money they don't come from privilege they've all kind of worked shitty jobs and they've now landed this amazing gig where they just sit around and talk about shit that they saw on the internet and music that they listen to and crazy stories that they're you know crazy stories they have about parties they went to and people they've seen it's basically the dream, dream job so to get that job and to kind of fuck it up on purpose is a bit messed up and then a small update here as well concerning it is that i guess house phone posted something on his instagram account um where he basically 
you know, let the fan knows that he appreciates the support, but also lets the fan knows to leave him the fuck alone, which is, you know, typical house fan really, isn't it? Doesn't understand why people are pissed at him at all. But it goes as follows. This is from House Fans uh, Instagram account. It says, I appreciate all the concerns, messages from people being positive, even the negative ones. LOL. I'm over I'm over making excuses. Um the other team so I'm over making excuses. The other people on the team don't deserve for me to keep acting the way I do. The supporters of No Jumper don't deserve it either. But sending me hateful messages or acting like I'm lying about my situation isn't doing anything but making the situation worse. Okay. If you really care about me, if you're a fan of the shows or me as a person, just think before you press and send on those messages. Y'all have blessed day and expect me to be on my shit from now on. Yeah, but he always says this, man. He always says this. And again, this to me is like classic behavior of somebody that does a lot of stuff outside of the podcast. Again, I could be I could be incorrect. It could definitely be something more serious and that, that we are not aware of. But the incons the the lack of consistency, the flakiness, um, the lateness, all this sort of stuff for me is was what things that I've kind of gone through in my time that I know I've struggled with that I've kind of probably messed up a few situations that I had in the past that were pretty that, that that may have had some you know some scope to it that I probably pissed up the wall because I was just getting too active outside of work and then I realized quite soon after especially after reading many many profiles of many different artists DJs musicians um you know brand owners founders and stuff the honest the real honest thing about it especially if you really dig deep into the details and read between the lines the people who are really smashing at the top level they don't indulge in the outside stuff. They don't even go outside. They don't even go out recreationally. They just focus on their craft, unfortunately. But they might, you know, they might um, perpetuate this image that they're a man about town, that they get on it, they do this. They don't really. There's no way of doing it. Like a good example I always use is Future or The Weeknd. Maybe there was a time in, in, their, in their, you know, uh, in the past where they were maybe party boys and getting on it and doing loads of drugs and you know snorting lines off a of flipping models breast and stuff but to be a, to be an artist of their caliber at the moment producing the bodies of work that they do in terms of albums putting on the live shows that they do going and doing Fallon appearances and all this sort of stuff you can't be doing that if you're always drinking lean you can't be doing that if you're snorting lines off the side of your phone you know before you jump onto Jimmy Fallon you just can't sooner or than later it catches up with you I know especially on my level I know I, just imagine what it is on their level where you get access to more things you have more people around you encouraging you it just isn't likely to happen that way so what they do is that they perpetuate this image to make it seem that they're fun party boys but really they're boring they just sit in the studio like if you read the actual accounts of future from people that have actually worked with him close collaborators they say he spends like you know whole days like days weeks on weeks just in the in the studio sleeping on an air mattress and stuff do you think you could do that all the time listening to music coming up with amazing hooks and you just drinking all day drinking lean getting smashed like no it doesn't work that way you there has to be a come a point where you're just focusing on the work there's no way you can you can fine tune a hi-hat or an ad lib when you're buzzed it doesn't work that way it really doesn't i've tried it trust me it doesn't work um same goes for the weekend like the weekend is a, a legit pop star now at the moment do you think he's doing as much blow as he was talking about when he was making house of balloons of course not man of course not and i doubt if he was ever doing in the purpose anyway do you know what i mean it's just is what it is um but yeah hopefully house Fun gets his stuff fixed up um or fixes himself up if he doesn't then life will end up just taking its natural course and you end up getting fired and things will end up just going where they need to go but it is a shame though you thought he, he was kind of you know he kind of figured it out and was finally you know realizing opportunity he was given and not taking it for granted especially after he had that chat with og suicide but it seems like you know nothing has really changed in that regard in it so maybe life has to just play out the way it does in order for him to learn the lessons he needs to learn you know it's sad but these these are these are the things that we have to go through and then another thing to quick update you on to move on we have news here courtesy of hypebeast it says gunner and young Thug denied bond in rico case which is obviously sad for me being a huge fan of both um and it looks like things are getting serious so the denial of the bond if i'm not mistaken from the stuff i've read online is because this this case that they've got against them is pretty hefty they've allegedly got wiretaps 
um, of no, not allegedly. It's, it's in the it's in the flipping documents. They've they've got wiretaps of Young Thug essentially um, reminding his people that he's in jail, or basically in, you know, eluding or reminding and telling them like, how come wife and Lucci hasn't been killed yet? Like, why haven't they got him out? You know, have, why haven't they got him up out of there? And I remember even seeing a screenshot somebody took of the document where they've got a screenshot of an iconic image from back in the day that I remember when when um, Young Thug was going through his beef with Wayne Finalucci and it was really hot on the timeline and they were saying some crazy shit to each other online. And I think if I'm not mistaken, the beef also stems from um, Young, Thug, Young Thug's off and on relationship with his longtime girlfriend. I forgot her name. I think Sharika or something like that. And the allegation was that wife and Lucci said something like, oh, he hollered at her and she was giving him attention back or something. She denied it at the time very aggressively, but that was what he was saying. And of course, Young Fai took that the disrespect. And I remember there was a period in time where they were going back and forth where one time Young Fai posted a picture very passive aggressively of him driving past and seeing wife and Lucci's car in the parking lot somewhere and taking a picture of it and saying, nice car in the caption. Then I remember seeing another picture of Yak Gotti, who's also from YSL. I think it was Yak Gotti standing on a hood of um, your wife and Lucy's car with his arms crossed, no caption needed, right? On his Instagram story that went flipping viral at the time when it happened. And, you know, I thought at that time something was going to happen, drop, but it was going to drop and it kind of just like died out. And I think they just, they just kept, they just kept out of each other's way. But it seems like the police were tracking and obviously building up a case on those guys since then. They were watching all of that stuff. Because I remember what was happening. It was going down thinking, this stuff shouldn't be on social media. This is like, this sounds like real street stuff. You know what I mean, real street rap or real rap stuff anyway. And it obviously happened and played out in real time. And of course, that's definitely affecting their ability to gain any sort of freedom now in this case. Even though it's not a federal case, it's still a state case. It looks like they've got a lot of evidence to put these guys away for a lot of time. And considering how where they are in their career, it's just and it just to me anyway. Because especially I think it hits home for me because I've been keep I don't really watch you know rappers Instagrams like that. But in the last couple of months, I've been you know checking in and he, here and there on Gunner's one because he's become a bit of a viral meme in it online with the way he dresses and you know how he smiles and looks and just just in general. And um, he was having a blast, man. He was having a blast lately. You know, going again, I keep saying, he's going to Italy, doing the whole Emilio Pucci thing, pushing P, like just having the whale of a time, especially off the back of that, you know, big um, album debut that he did first week numbers and whatnot. And then to go from that to be in the jail cell with your, you know, with your hands, you know, shackled and your feet shackled, suffering from withdrawals and stuff, it just seems bleak. But I guess this is nature of the beast, isn't it? The only disappointing thing, again, to say off the back of it is that these guys were multi millionaires, like legit multi millionaires. They've made more money now in their life than they probably ever did when they were coming up on the streets. So to take all that and to still be doing street stuff just doesn't make any sense. Usually what happens is that you're wrapped up in the street stuff and then you try and pull away from it the more money you start getting because obviously your exposure is at another level and you don't want to risk your freedom and the safety of your family because, you know, you got involved with street stuff. But it seems like with them, the reverse happened. They started a label kind of thing and then they kept they kept increasing the street stuff as they got more famous. Really strange. And even the involvement, it wasn't even like they put people in between them to kind of like, you know, um, to feign ignorance or to to delegate. They were literally hands-on. Like, no, I'm one of the founders. I'm telling you to go and shank this guy in the bathroom. I'm telling you to do that. I'm telling you to slide. It's like, <sighs> such a dumb move, man. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? Next on the list here... We have news courtesy of Hypebeast regarding the Adidas and Gucci shoes. I like all of them. I have to be honest. I would wear the book out of every single one of these shoes. I have to be completely honest. They're a bit naff looking. They're a bit hipsterish. They're a bit passion for fashion-y. If I'm not, if I'm not, you know, if I'm being completely honest, but you know, I would wear the hell out of them. The only problem for me is my wide you know burly african feet don't tend to fit that well in slim adidas's especially fashion ones right they don't seem to fit especially this profile or this model sorry the gazelle my foot has a really hard time fitting these kind of shoes i'll give it another go again but i remember last time i tried on a uk, a UK 10 that it fit but then it was really tight at the front then when i decided to uk 10.5 it was then really loose at the back so my feet are just too wide to fit into these you know slivet things 
So it says as follows here, as the world gears up to the release of the Adidas and Gucci, the latter has started to tell to tell all about its upcoming collaboration including pricing information and a closer look at the entire collection. While the collection has been a well documented since it first appeared on Gucci Runway for 2022, um, we now get a closer look at some of the greatest pieces from the partnership, that being the footwear. Notably, Adidas original fans are well served um, with a bevy of gazelles on offer um, coming in the iconic beige and brown GG fabric, um, white leather and light blue Okay, those colors. Um, each bar... Each, so each bears gazelle's insignia in its OG lettering in the lateral mid panel, sitting alongside the three stripes. Further, the Gucci branding hits up on the heels tab with some pair sporting the GG motif around the perimeter. Elsewhere, Gucci also serves a closer look at some of the more detailed footwear on offer, such as the leather and the suede heeled loafers that sport the antique gold horse bit finishing. Um, on the throat alongside the quintessential green pumps are also appeared as do slippers so let's go through the entire collection here and see what they've got the gazelles look obviously banging i'd wear the hell out of that especially that green oh i thought that was flipping them um, i had a heart attack there i thought that was um what's that wild lad's name hidden or something hidden in white socks as i say no not again man those things are turning into half weed socks but the bad version you know what i mean we don't need no more hidden out here, man. Hidden can go get fucked. But anyway, continue. Gazelle, pink shoes look nice there. Me likey. The green ones look great. The aqua teal ones with the kind of icy sole I like. Um, we've got some brown ones with the GG motif all over them. These have got my uncles written all over them. Uncles, Persians, um, Middle Eastern guys. I can see some of my Pakistani and Indian dons over this way wearing these for sure. Um, you got the clogs you can go and jump off a hill with those ones the loafers i'd wear the hell out of these but this this kind of reminds me of all those palace wild lads you know what i mean people who like roll their own cigarettes um you know and have that weird hunchback thing and have sailor tattoos and shit that's the type of person i would wear this kind of thing but i like them anyway still but you know what i mean um but yeah the gazelles and pink look really nice i like them in that forest green that aquamarine kind of color is good red yellow classic i like that they've got the classic colorways too and they've also got them in the crazy you know i'm passion for fashion ones the ones with the gg motif are probably going to be the standout ones i said that my uncle would wear because obviously they've got the gucci fabric all over them which is pretty crazy now. imagine to think that that nowadays we're living in, a, in an era where collaborations are look like this where you can have like an adidas gazelle covered in gucci moniker so it's pretty nuts in it this wouldn't happen in years gone by because Gucci would feel like, oh no, hey, that's a competition in terms of footwear because we make our own footwear. It's like, no, mate, increase your market share, man. Collaborate. You know what I mean? Remix, collaborate, increase your market share. Um, get get on board. Move with the times. So yeah, that's nice to see. The blue pair is really cool too. I love this two-tone effect they've got here. I think I saw it in a purple too. So the front and where the lace stays are, you have this kind of really rich blue suede and then on the other on the on the main body you've got this light um almost sky blue suede so i'm not sure if it's either the material whether or not this is just maybe suede hard suede and this is more of a new buck finish hence why it's got a different finish on it i'm not really too sure but i do like the colors the blue the yellow the red with that brown gum outsole is just banging if these fit my feet i would wear these i'm really um i'm not joking the clogs can go I see people wearing clogs and I just think of, you know, oh, I can't really say it. But yeah, we'll continue. The loafers, like I said, are great. But again, remind me too much of those Palace Well lads. But, you know, I guess it is what it is. Um, but the brown ones, oh, the brown ones are tough, innit? Tough. But you know what? They do look a bit fake, innit? They look like, you know those shoes that you'd get in Dawson Market, right? Adidas that like, mixed into it. Like, they look a bit mad that way. But I do like them, I've got to be honest, I do bloody like them, especially that gold tassel with the little um, green and red uh, stripe there underneath. The black levers can go, yeah, the black levers can go, it's only. It's probably between the greys and the browns, the black levers can jump. Although the black levers are classic, you know, Gucci loafer colorway, isn't it? And with that heel too, boys are going to be on it, because that'll give, that'll make you, if you're 5'9", that'll make you 6 foot. You know what I mean, with that heel, so... <laughs> um, the pumps the heels yeah we can miss with that one don't care um these are quite nice the clogs with this with that are kind of stacked up they look pretty decent right again these are very passion for fashion this is like a stylist you meet is gonna wear these um 
what's the other person called a production assistant i'd imagine wearing these the person doing the guest list at some fashion event will probably have these on sorry what's your name again fuck off <laughs> some other sandals with the velcro on it these are nice these fluffy sandals are beautiful actually oh i love these these are very very nice give me it's giving Bottega Veneta. yeah that's what it's giving right did i do that right it's giving Bottega Veneta. Did I do that? maybe i didn't matter who knows um nice um green slippers here with a very chunky white outsole um it's got like a fluffy almost carpety sort of fabric on the main footbed across of course the strap as well with the gg motive written on it and i'm guessing the strap is a velcro or maybe some button snap hopefully it's not button snap because if it's button snap it'll have rivets underneath it which will chew up your feet underneath here so hopefully it's just velcro but these look very nice this is definitely um model agent yeah model agency person um makeup assist you know makeup artist at a fashion runway show wearing these behind the scenes uh photographer's assistant you know those kind of people not photographers because you're going to move around too much the kind of people are just gallivant around you know um pr maybe not pr production assistant maybe overall maybe i can see wearing those kind of things the red ones look uh, the red ones definitely give me um what's her name um what's that design the stylist name lotta volkova is it lotta volkova lotta the woman from um that woman that's uh that did the stuff with demna is that her name lotta yeah, that's her name. Lots of Volkova, right? Is that her? Oh, or my, or my bugging out. Yeah, is that her? Yeah, it's giving her. The red ones give her. I can see her wearing these. Uh, where is it? Da, 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 da. Is it here? Yeah, there. I can see her wearing these for sure. That's definitely her shoe. Let's not even play around with that one. I mean, let's not play. That's her. This is definitely a lot of shoe. Don't you think so? A lot, lot of these should, should be all over these, I think hey what do i know let's move on and then yeah yeah and then yeah the, the slipper things which again i could see some of my um asian compadres who live in and around the area i mean especially near the international school some of those um, guys and girls who love the furry gucci loafers they'll be all over these slapping their feet along the slapping and dragging their feet along the floor as they're walking in front of me annoying but i get it man swag out swag out so yeah those are due to come out when when's the release date they're saying here we have no idea what was the release date oh sorry the release date is everything here sorry take a closer look everything is set to drop on the june 7th with the gazelles coming in at approximately 680 oh you could buy what i'll be that guy says that sort of stuff you could buy what like six pairs of gazelles for that price and it how much do, how much the gazelles go for adidas gazelle retail price how much do they go for at the moment you can get a pair of gazelles for 70 pounds so you could get a, a decent how many gazelles could you get for 600 let's see because they're probably going to be 600 anyway when it comes to uk price they're not like they're going to convert them to pounds no way um uh, let's see let's see uh so maybe about 10 you could get probably 10 pairs of shoes standard gazelles for the price of that mad isn't it you have to you have to really like gazelles or really like you know um gucci to probably jump on that in that way then isn't it maybe god damn that's a lot of money in it but i get it man i get it because they're really nice shoes to be completely honest the, the selection available is pretty crazy all right I would get definitely these two here at the bottom, the pink and that blue. And obviously, you know, this blue, this pink. Forget that blue. Let's get let's go with these two. They're probably my favourites here. The blue, yellow, and red. And then the pink, black, and greens. And then of course the Gucci all over colorways, pretty decent too, but you know, they're a bit too crazy probably. Um yeah, so probably those two would be my favourites to go ahead and but yeah, to spend nearly what, you know, fifteen hundred on two pairs of gazelles is fucking nuts. Especially because most of the people I think who'd see you wearing these would just think they're GRs, isn't it? <laughs> they wouldn't think they were they were Gucci. So you'd probably have to get something more loud to make them, you know, maybe something like that people would think were Gucci. Um, or maybe you'd have to get one of these ones and then people would maybe think they were Gucci there. I'm not too sure, but yeah, it's a bit nuts, man. The pricing is absolutely incredible. But big up if you if you end up buying them yourself, innit? Big up you. Um, What else we got here? 
Um, yeah, we got this. So this is Curse Your High Beast. This is regarding Sneeze Magazine, one of my favorite magazines out there, skateboarding, lifestyle, culture, whatever it may be called. They've actually got a last, one of their recent episodes they did with Virgil on the cover. I'm actually trying to get a copy of that. So if, if anyone has one for sale, please let me know. I'll definitely buy that off of you. Um, but they've been doing a couple of these collaborations, I feel like, with um, Reebok on the, what's it? on this is it c club whatever the shoe is that model i think this is a different c club maybe this is the one because it's, it's suede maybe they change the name maybe it's just a different model altogether no it's a different model altogether it's called the suede lt court but i've long said on this channel or on this podcast that i absolutely hate reeboks and my reebok hate comes from a real place because i'm from london and the part of east london i'm from reeboks were synonymous with the national front um and those people obviously weren't nice to people that look like me <laughs> and i have memories burned in deep into my cranium of you know skinners and stuff chasing me down the street um wearing reebok classics and really tight lecoq sportive tracksuits trying to kick my head in and ever since then the image of reeboks has been you know negative for me and then when i come into streetwear and fashion and all that sort of stuff and i see people fantal you know not fantasizing kind of um fetishizing reebok and working class culture especially people like the palace types you know those types or people that roll up their own cigarettes and listen to nts on their phone those type of people wearing reebok classics and white socks and dirty nails they just make me sick and i hate the shoes but then sometimes you see models like this and you're like oh i wish i could wear reeboks because these are hard what sneeze done with these are really really cool so it's like a black from what i can see here looking at the pictures it's, it's a black upper it's a black suede upper to some extent with this amazing contrast stitch and if you know me you would know i love a good contrast stitch especially on black give me a good contrast stitch a black and white contrast stitch and i'm absolutely all over them if i'd be a little bit picky i'd say i'd maybe want the midsole to be white to kind of break up the colors a little bit because it's just all black with a white outsole maybe that would make it a little bit a little bit great but regardless and the fact that they're not even laced correctly and i still like them which goes a long way because i i have a big pet peeve about product shots being taken like this like they don't even make any effort they just pulled them out of the box and just took the pictures they didn't even relace them look they're still fluffing cruffing stuff on there someone's clearly worn them as well they're a little bit groggy like come on man they're product shots you're meant to make them look beautiful like take out the laces steam them a little bit you know what i mean maybe take some sellotape and flick off some of the soot on there but anyway all that stuff aside i still like them and they kind of remind me in a weird way too they kind of remind me of those um louis vuitton skate shoes that virgil made what are they called again um louis vuitton skate shoe sneakers what are they called it's like a low it's like a jordan yeah that one it reminds me of this the louis vuitton lv trainer what's it called what's the actual model called though is it called sneakers is that it is that what the model's called what's the actual model the name of it surely it can't be called a sneaker what's it called yeah what's this one called this one this thing here is it called the lv trainer or is it called the lv i don't know but anyway this model it kind of reminds me a little bit of that uh where is it where's the thing uh this yeah so this reminds me of this a little bit what what do you guys think or am i bugging out i think they look quite similar don't you think so oh, where is it? i keep losing it there you go I think they look pretty similar to me, but maybe I'm, maybe I am bugging up. I think they look pretty similar, but I do like them and they look really, really cool. So like I said, I wish I could just wear, I wish I could wear um, um, Reeboks because look, they look really great. They've got the little sneeze um, hang tag there. Also the tag, whatever you call it, you call it hang tag, whatever. Um, the green colorway is really nice. Oof, the green color might be even better than the blacks, you know? And again, I'm a big sucker for black shoes. But these look superb, especially with that off-white kind of outsole there. Oh, really, really, really nice. So good. So I'm wondering, what should I do? Should I break my no Reebok, my my, my no Reebok um, promise, or should I just leave these for the for the guys who roll who, who roll up their own cigarettes and play flipping um scar? <laughs> vinyl and stuff what should i do i don't know man i don't know um when they're meant to be coming out they're meant to drop on may 20th and they're priced at 120 euros approximately 120 you 25 usd but they look fucking banging in it oh, 
I don't know what to do. Should I buy them or shouldn't I not? Hmm. I'll decide soon. I'll decide soon. But yeah, check them out if you're interested. Check them out if you're interested. Oh, damn. My fucking hay fever's flaring up again, as you can tell. Uh, sorry about that. So, next on the list here, we should move to this news that really piss me off that's on a timeline so this is courtesy of over under and they shared this news it says louis vuitton and nike air force one by virgil abloh client order sheet the shoes retail at 2000 euros for the lows and 2500 for the highs exclusively available to top louis vuitton clients the general public will not be able to purchase and to me that is a direct spit in the face of Virgil Abloh's legacy that these won't be available to purchase for the everyday consumer like you and I. Don't get me wrong, maybe I wouldn't have the 2,000 euros available to hand to purchase them, but not having the opportunity to do so or to even pontificate or to think about doing so, to even have the ability to save to get them is really annoying. Really, really annoying. The whole point of Virgil making these shoes, I think part of the reason was obviously the legacy of the Air Force One um, was obviously, you know, Louis Vuitton's place and influence within streetwear, within fashion in general, the Air Force One's attachment towards streetwear and fashion in general, and mixing and bringing those things together was essentially a celebration of everything that makes fashion streetwear as great as it is. And instead of having both of those things occupy different fields and have one person standing on one side of the room, one side on the other side of the room, he was always somebody that brought people together. And what better way to bring people together than to make a shoe that would represent the low of society and then to take a brand like Louis Vuitton, which is the height of society, and bring them together. Do you know what I mean? Like, and he basically said this himself, right? He liked to always mix the overground and the underground to take the commercial with the underground to take the whatever it may be, right? All this kind of things are stuff that Virgil said ad nauseum over the years. And to now, you know, in the wake of his death, to release these shoes and only have them available to limited edition or sort of VIP clients makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Yes, there should be some available to VIP clients, of course, but there should be a large majority of these shoes made available to the wider public, especially in the wake of his death. This would be an ultimate way to celebrate his life, especially because this is the pinnacle of his collaborations that he did with Nike. The, the stuff that he did with the Nike 10 collaboration was some stuff that I think will go down in sneaker history, right? But the thing that, the thing that will maybe he will be remembered for the most was the way that he kind of, you know, uh, punctuated that entire Nike story by making the, again this probably wasn't the final piece of the whole nike story that he had i'm sure these were maybe made uh, it wouldn't be surprising if these were made at the same time he was making the nike 10 stuff but as a kind of story arc to see from the outside in it, just like a general person looking from the outside who has no extra info it's quite nice to see that the end point it came with air force ones and it just came with just doing them in a classic way, using Louis Vuitton leather materials and then applying them on like the classic Air Force One shape and silhouette that everyone knows and loves. That I think was a pinnacle of like showing, okay, cool, this is the meeting of these two worlds. And to not have them available for the general public, I think is a real, real piss take. And if anything, this to me further solidifies why people are buying rips. This is another good reason why, because fair enough, live edition shoe comes out and you can't even purchase it because of bots and resellers or whatnot cool but they're telling you outright from the get-go you can't buy these these are not for you you are not worthy to purchase these so what are most people going to do who just want to wear them and want to floss and want to honor someone's legacy or they just want to you know be part of the cool club cool guy club and don't really care about anything else they're just going to go out and buy reps especially if the reps are of decent enough quality to make them passable because for the wide majority of people, I think they won't necessarily know that these are made with Louis Vuitton leather, le leather materials. They might have seen them beforehand online, but they won't know the extent of the craftsmanship that goes into them, if there is any. Because I'm a bit dubious to that too, because they love, they love to speak about that sort of stuff, but we don't really see any evidence of it. They just probably use the same levers they use in, in general stuff. But hey, I don't want to get into that conspiracy. But that aside, with the standard and quality that replica sneakers are at the moment, these people are just asking for trouble. And then when it comes to selling stuff or buying stuff on StockX, if you've got the money and you want to get these on resale, I would 
I would really implore you to make sure you get yourself on that VIP order, order list because there's no guarantee that what you'll be purchasing on Stockers is going to be real. There's no guarantee, zero. And, you know, it's it's one thing for me to go out and buy a rep because I can't buy the legit pair, but it's, it's another pain to pay authentic prices and then end up with a replica sneaker that would i don't know how how much that would hurt me that would hurt me to another level because you know replica sneakers are usually cheaper than retail right so imagine you you pay flipping what let's say ten thousand for a pair of these and then you end up realizing that they're reps which would retail for like three hundred dollars or something absolutely crazy you, you don't want that to happen to you so that that's yeah, that's basically the point I was making. I just can't believe that they would do this, especially in the wake of what's going on with StockX and Nike lawsuit. You'd think they'd be have a bit more of an eye on the market, wouldn't want to flood it with fakes. But unfortunately, this is just going to flood it with fakes, especially if a few of these colorways be become the more favorite ones with people, especially resellers. You're going to see them all over the place. So I pray for anyone trying to buy these retail. I really do, because you are going to be in for a shock. The market is going to be flooded with fakes, in my opinion, personally. Um, if I had to pick from a colorway, it'd probably be these ones here, the kind of uh, silver, black with yellows, or maybe it'll be like the classic all white mid, or yeah, the classic white mid top with a leather with the leather LV monogram embossed all over it. Those look pretty hard, or of course, just the classic lows with the leather embossed all over it also. But those three are probably my standout ones, just because of the, you know, I know that shape, I know that silhouette. And I know that colorway pretty easily. Um, okay, this is the four sheet someone has available here. Oh, that Celtics colorway is pretty tough. I'm not really a fan of the gold, I've got to be honest. I'm actually surprised that they're not they're not priced based on the kind of application. You know, some people would think maybe the gold would be more or the, this one with a different color. I mean, it's all just all one all one all one the price. Doesn't matter if you're purchasing a mid or um or a or a low. Interesting, they went from mids and they're not highs. Interesting. But yeah, um, the ones with the spray paint on the side too look pretty decent. I wonder who did the artwork for that. That looks sick. But yeah, I'll definitely go for these here, which are, what's the colorway? Monogram embossed suede calf leather and monogram and best metallized canvas. And then you've got this one with the monogram leather, monogram embossed in the green. That one's nice. And of course the white in it, the monogram embossed on these ones is going to be so hard. Like people thinking you're wearing regular Air Force Ones, they look closer and they see all the little LVs on the top. Ooh. They've even got the flipping um, um, Home Invasion Air Force Ones available too with the leather and bust all over them. Absolutely splendid. Splendid, splendid, splendid. But yeah, um, I guess keep an eye out for them if you're interested. You're probably not going to be able to get them anyway, as I'm not going to be able to get them. So most likely what I'm going to be able to do, I'm going to have to call up my my um, my Shanghai brothers and we're going to have to get these shipped over Beijing, Shanghai, wherever they're made. And I'm going to have to get a rep of these because I need them. I need them. I really do, really, really do need them. Um, they look absolutely fantastic. I'd wear every single pair of these really would. But again, Nike just keep making it difficult for us to actually purchase shoes. And then they wonder why the rep market exists. They absolutely won this. Absolutely shocking um, own goal from them. But, you know, I guess they know better than I do. I guess they know better than I do. Anyway, that has been the Agassino Zing Show episode number 576. Thanks again for tuning into the show. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's the first time you're checking me out, you know what to do all the good stuff down below please and of course support the patreon i've got a new episode out on there at the moment so definitely check that out if you're interested um and yeah i appreciate the support as a per usual and we're going to close out the show with a song from little kid taken from long live mexico r.i.p little kid absolutely tragic news to hear of his passing especially being a fan of, of of his music myself and somebody i discovered only a few years ago so tragic to hear that and you know thoughts and prayers go out to the entire ysl they're going through an incredibly tough time at the moment they were going through the highest of the highest gunner and young Fug, and now they're on the lowest of the lowest but hopefully the music you know will be something that can bring us some comfort as fans on the outside but yeah this is a track from Lil Keed taken off the album or mixtape called Long Live Mexico if you haven't checked it out already please do check it out and I'll be seeing you guys again very soon peace